Hello friends, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I am studying ENT, starting with embryology of ear and malformations. The first and second branchial arches give rise to the pinna or auricle through six mesenchymal proliferation. These proliferations are called auricular hillocks and they fuse to form the auricle. The tissue from the second arch forms nearly all of the pinna. The tissue from the first arch forms the tragus and external auditory meatus. Structures of the ear along with its embryological origin, that is, first of all, auricle or pinna, it originates from first and second pharyngeal arch. External auditory meatus originates from first pharyngeal arch. Tympanic membrane originates from all the three germ layers. Malleus and ingus origins from first pharyngeal arch. Stepes suprastructure is from second pharyngeal arch. Stepes food plate and annular ligament from otic capsule. Tympanic cavity from first pharyngeal pouch. Eustachian tube from first pharyngeal pouch. Membranous labyrinth from otic vesicle. Semicircular canals and utricle from pars superior. Secule and cochlea from pars inferior. Next is a case. A patient is incidentally noted to have sinus seen between the tragus and crust of the helix on both ears. It is suggestive of pre-auricular sinus. It is due to improper fusion of auricular tubercle formed from the first and second arches. The pre-auricular sinus is apparent at birth and it is usually bilateral. There may be occasional sebaceous discharge from the punctum. It does not regress spontaneously. Reconstructive surgeries for congenital malformations of the pinna, which is also known as auricle, are usually performed around 5 or 6 years of age. Autologous cartilages from ribs are harvested for these purposes and the ideal timing is between 6 to 10 years. At around 3 years of age, 85% of the auricular growth is complete and the cartilaginous growth is almost complete by 5 years. Surgery performed on the auricle after 5 years doesn't hinder further growth. Invagination of the first pharyngeal arch gave rise to the external auditory meatus. Previously, it was believed that the external auditory meatus develops from the first pharyngeal cleft, but recent studies suggest that the first pharyngeal arch gave rise to the external auditory meatus. Next case is examination of a child with otoria revealed two discharging sinuses. One was present on the floor of the left external auditory canal and the other on the left neck just below the angle of mandible. Given clinical scenario is suggestive of choloral fistula and the first branchial cleft which is abnormal here. The fistula has two openings that is one situated in the neck just below and behind the angle of mandible and the other one in the external canal or the middle ear. The track of the fistula transverses through the parotid in close relation to the facial nerve. Tympanic membrane develops from all three germinal layers that is outer epithelial layer which is formed by the ectoderm, inner mucosal layer by the endoderm, middle fibrous layer by the mesoderm. Parts of tympanic membrane are pars tensa and pars flaccida. Pars tensa is taut, middle fibrous layer is well organized, contains annulus tympanicus, transmits sound. Next about pars flaccida, it is loose, middle fibrous layer is not well organized, pars flaccida is also known as shrapnel's membrane, it does not transmit sound. In detail about the layers of the tympanic membrane, outer layer is epithelium, it is continuous with skin of external auditory canal, outer layer is derived from ectoderm, middle layer is fibrous layer, it is derived from mesoderm, middle fibrous layer is made of circular, radial and parabolic fibers, inner layer is mucosa layer, inner layer is continuous with middle ear mucosa, inner layer is derived from endoderm. The eustachian tube develops from the first pharyngeal pouch. Initially, the first pharyngeal pouch forms the tubotympanic recess. The distal part of this recess widens to form the middle ear cavity. The proximal part forms the eustachian tube. The first pharyngeal arch gives rise to malleus and incus. Steppe superstructure is formed from the second arch, whereas the steppe's foot plate develops from the otic capsule. 
ഇയർ ഓസിക്കൽസ് അറ്റൈൻ അഡൽട്ട് സൈസ് ബിഫോർ ബർത്ത് ദ ഡെവലപ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ മിഡിൽ ഇയർ ഈസ് ലൈക്ക് ദ ഓസിക്കൽസ് ആർ ഫുൾ സൈസ്ഡ് കാർട്ടിലേജ് മോഡൽസ് ബൈ ഫിഫ്റ്റീൻ വീക്സ് ഓഫ് ജസ്റ്റേഷൻ ഇൻഡോകോൺട്രൽ ഓസിഫിക്കേഷൻ ഇസ് കംപ്ലീറ്റ് ബൈ ട്വൻറ്റി ഫൈവ് വീക്സ് ദ മിഡിൽ ഇയർ ഈസ് അഡൽട്ട് സൈസ്ഡ് അറ്റ് ബർത്ത് ദ മാസ്റ്റോയിഡ് ഡസ് നോട്ട് റീച്ച് അഡൾട്ട് സൈസ് അറ്റ് ബർത്ത് ഇറ്റ് ഡെവലപ്സ് ഫുള്ളി ബൈ ടു ഇയേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ഏജ് ഇൻ ഇൻഫാൻസ് ആൻഡ് ചിൽഡ്രൻ അപ് ടു ടു ഇയേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ഏജ് ദ മാസ്റ്റോയിഡ് പ്രോസസ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഡെവലപ്ഡ് കംപ്ലീറ്റ്ലി സോ ദ ഫേഷ്യൽ നർവ് ലൈസ് ജസ്റ്റ് ബിനീത്ത് ദ സ്കിൻ നിയർ ഇറ്റ്സ് എക്സിറ്റ് ഹെൻസ് ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് സർജിക്കൽ പ്രൊസീജിയേഴ്സ് ദ ഇൻസിഷൻ ഇസ് ഗിവൻ സ്ലാൻഡിങ് പോസ്റ്റീരിയർലി അവോയ്ഡിംഗ് ദ ലോവർ പാർട്ട് ഓഫ് ദ മാസ്റ്റോയിഡ് ദിസ് പെയേഴ്സ് ദ ഫേഷ്യൽ നർവ് Next is a case an ENT surgeon has difficulty locating the mastoid antrum due to the presence of corner septum the persistence of the petrous squamous suture is called corner septum and it is responsible for the difficulty in locating the mastoid antrum and the deeper cells corner septum separates superficial squamosal cells from the deep petrosal cells Incomplete removal of disease at mastoidectomy can occur if corner septum is not identified. Mastoid andrum cannot be reached unless the corner septum has been removed. The saccule develops from the pars inferior. Development of internal ear is the surface ectoderm on each side of the rhomben cephalon thickens to form otic placodes. the otic placodes then invaginate to form the otic vesicle which is also known as otocyst the cells of the otic vesicle differentiate to form ganglion cells which later develop into the vestibulo cochlear ganglia later each otic vesicle divides into a dorsal component called pars superior and a ventral component called pars inferior pars superior give rise to utricle semicircular canals and endolymphatic ducts pars inferior give rise to saccule and cochlear duct the saccule is connected to the cochlea through a narrow duct called ductus reunions the inner ear develops from 14 ossification centers the fetus starts hearing in the womb of the mother by 20 weeks of gestation due to sufficient development of the cochlea The pinna and the external auditory canal are made of yellow elastic cartilage. It is also called auricular cartilage. Next is a case. A 25-year-old woman undergoes a rhinoplasty procedure to correct a deformity of her nose. Auricular cartilage is harvested from her right pinna. Incisura terminalis cannot be used to harvest cartilage as it is devoid of cartilage. It is the part of the pinna between the tragus and the crust of helix. Being devoid of cartilage, the incision for endoral approach for ear surgery can be made here. The lobule is also devoid of cartilage, hence it is the safest site for piercing. The parts of pinna are triangular fossa, incisura terminalis, external acoustic meatus, tragus, lobule, concha, antihelix, helix as well as antitragus the skin over the pinna is loosely adherent on the medial or cranial side hence it is pinchable the skin is firmly adherent to the perichondrium on the lateral side and is non pinchable the length of the external auditory canal is about 24 mm it extends from the bottom of the concha to the tympanic membrane it has two parts that is outer cartilaginous part of 8 mm and inner bony part of 16 mm lateral one third of external auditory canal is cartilaginous and medial two third of external auditory canal is bony in detail about the cartilaginous external auditory canal length is 8 mm cartilaginous part is made of auricular yellow elastic cartilage direction is upward backward and medially skin is thick skin contains hair ceruminous and pilosebaceous glands it produces wax deficiencies of cartilaginous part of external auditory canal is fissures of santorini next is about bony external auditory canal length is 16 mm it is made of bony margins of the temporal bone that is squamous part superiorly and mastoid part posteriorly direction to examine is downward forward and medially 
skin is thin continuous over tympanic membrane deficiencies of bony part of external auditory canal is foramen of hushke next case is you are an intern asked to do an otoscopic examination of a young adult in which direction will you pull the pinna to visualize the tympanic membrane this is the question the pinna has to be pulled upwards backwards and laterally to visualize the tympanic membrane this is done to bring the bony and cartilaginous part of the external auditory canal in alignment the inner bony part is directed downwards forwards and medially the outer cartilaginous part is directed upwards backwards and medially next case is a patient with otitis externa develops parotitis you suspect that the infection has spread through the fissures of centaurini here in this case fissures of centaurini are the two deficiencies in the cartilaginous part of the external auditory canal they provide a pathway for the spread of parotid or superficial mastoid infections to the canal or vice versa the bony canal also has a deficiency called the foramen of hushke which act as a pathway for the spread of infections and tumors to the deep lobe of parotid pharyngeals which is staphylococcal infection of the hair follicles are seen only in the outer one third of the canal since hair is confined to the outer canal skin is also very tightly adherent to the cartilage and hence pharyngeals are extremely painful Seruminous glands are modified apocrine sweat glands they open into hair follicles and participate in wax production apocrine glands release their products by decapitation it is a process by which membrane bound cytoplasm from the apical surface of the cells buds off into the lumen of the duct and is secreted some apocrine glands have specific names that is those on eyelids are referred to as moles glands and those on the external auditory meatus are termed seruminous glands the isthmus is the narrowest part of the external auditory canal it is situated 6 mm lateral to the tympanic membrane in the bony part of the external auditory canal foreign bodies that go beyond the isthmus are difficult to remove and are called impacted The normal tympanic membrane is pearly grey in color it is thin and semi translucent peripheral part of tympanic membrane is more mobile than the central part of tympanic membrane where the handle of malleus is attached the tympanic membrane develops from all three germinal layers it has three layers that is outer epithelial layer from ectoderm middle fibrous layer from mesoderm inner mucosal layer that is endoderm tympanic membrane consists of lateral process of malleus anterior malleal fold posterior malleal fold handle of malleus umbo cone of light pars placida the tympanic membrane has a thickness of 0.1 mm the dimensions of the tympanic membrane are length 9 to 10 mm width 8 to 9 mm area 90 mm square that is 90 area 90 90 mm square and it subtends an angle of 55 degree with horizontal the medial or inner surface is convex and the lateral surface is concave the most depressed part of its concavity is called the ambo to which the tip of malleus is attached pars placida is also known as shrapnel's membrane pars placida is situated above the lateral process of malleus between the notch of rivinus and the anterior and posterior malleolar folds a bright cone of light can be seen radiating from the tip of malleus that is umbo to the periphery in the andro inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane greater auricular nerve supplies most of the medial surface and posterior portion of lateral surface of the external ear lesser occipital nerve supplies superior portion of medial surface of external ear auricular branch supplies concave and antihelix some supply medial surface that is eminesia conca auricular temporal nerve supplies tragus crust of helix and adjacent helix facial nerve supplies small region in the root of conca and retro auricular groove next is a case a patient develops tingling and numbness along the upper part of the medial surface of pinna 
here in this case the upper part of the medial surface of the pinna is supplied by the lesser occipital nerve next case is a patient coughs when removing excess cerumen from the ear this is due to the stimulation of vagus nerve this is known as reflex cough reflex cough is due to stimulation of auricular branch of vagus it can occur when cleaning or during an examination of the ear auricular branch of vagus is also called arnold's nerve or alderman's nerve tympanic branch of cranial nerve 9 is also called jacobson's nerve sensory root of the facial nerve is also called the nerve of risberg and carries secreto motor fibers to the lacrimal gland and salivary glands and brings fibers of taste and general sensation the spinal accessory nerve that is cranial nerve 11 does not supply the tympanic membrane tympanic membrane is supplied by auriculotemporal nerve and auricular branch of vagus nerve in the lateral surface of tympanic membrane and on the medial surface of tympanic membrane it is supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve that is tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve which is also known as jacobson's nerve that is cranial nerve 9 next case is a 25 year old patient presents with bleeding from his ear following a road traffic accident a temporal bone fracture can cause bleeding from the ear as it is related to the roof of the middle ear and the external auditory canal the relations of the external auditory canal are superiorly middle cranial fossa inferiorly parotid gland anteriorly temporomandibular joint posteriorly mastoid air cells and facial nerve next is cough on scratching the external acoustic canal is due to the auricular branch of vagus nerve which is also called arnold's nerve ear cough reflex which is also known as auto respiratory reflex is the arnold's nerve innervates the skin over a small part of the ear and external auditory canal in patients with chronic cough scratching or mechanical stimulation of ear leads to activation of arnold's nerve which evokes reflex cough the flat non ciliated epithelium is found in the mastoid air cells and the epitympanum the mucosal lining of the middle ear is continuous with that of the nasopharynx but shows variations that is bony eustachian tube there is ciliated columnar epithelium cartilaginous eustachian tube we can see ciliated pseudo stratified columnar epithelium pro tympanum there is ciliated columnar epithelium most of the middle ear space there is cuboidal epithelium epi tympanum and mastoid air cells we can see flat non ciliated epithelium the mastoid antrum is the largest mastoid air cell it is the most constant mastoid air cell because it is present even in a sclerotic mastoid the attic or the epitympanum is the part of the middle ear adjacent to its roof aditus ad antrum is the pathway or the connection between mastoid antrum and attic next case is a patient with acute coalescent mastoiditis undergoes cortical mastoidectomy in this case mckeven's triangle which is also known as supramedial triangle it is used as a surgical landmark to locate the mastoid antrum in an adult the antrum lies 12 to 15 mm from the surface this triangle is also the site of tenderness in acute mastoiditis mckeven's or supramedial triangle it is bounded by temporal line postero superior segment of bony external auditory canal and the line drawn as a tangent to the external canal promontory does not form the boundary of the supramedial triangle boundaries of mckeven's or supramedial triangle once again i am saying it is superiorly temporal line anteriorly postero superior segment of the bony external auditory canal posteriorly line drawn as a tangent to the external canal it is an important landmark to locate the mastoid antrum in mastoid surgery mandible is not a pneumatic bone some bones of the skull notably the mastoid process of the temporal bone and the paranasal sinuses of the frontal maxilla sphenoid and ethmoid bones many of the internal cavities are filled with air that is they are variably pneumatized the maxillae are the largest of the pneumatized bones of the mid face they contain the maxillary air sinuses and bear the upper teeth 
The mastoid consists of a bone cortex with a honeycomb of air cells underneath. Next case is you are evaluating a patient with past history of chronic separative otitis media. The CT is suggestive of sclerosis and loss of aeration of mastoid air cells. The type of mastoid pneumatization in the given clinical scenario is acellular or sclerotic mastoid. Here, sclerosis and loss of aeration of mastoid air cells are seen. Sclerotic mastoids contain only mastoid antrum, which is small with anti-post sigmoid sinus. It can occur due to eustachian or middle ear disease in childhood, preventing mastoid development. Other types of mastoid pneumatization are well pneumatized or cellular, which contains multiple air spaces, and diploitic, that is, it contains air cells and marrow spaces. The temporal bone consists of squamous part, mastoid part, petrous part, tympanic part, styloid process, and zygomatic process. Speaking in detail about the temporal bone, squamous part of temporal bone articulates with the parietal bone. The persistence of petrosquamous suture is called corner septum. Mastoid part which is posteroinferiorly placed, its outer surface forms a conical projection which is known as mastoid process, sternocleidomastoid, splenius capitis and longissimus capitis attach here. Petrous part which is situated medially, the arcuate eminence is related to the superior semicircular canal below. The posterior surface combines the internal auditory meatus. The vestibular aqueduct is present behind the internal auditory meatus. The inferior surface contains the carotid canal and jugular fossa which is also known as jugular notch. Tympanic part is present centrally. It contains the external auditory meatus and the bony external auditory meatus which is 16 mm long. The supramiatal triangle is present above the external auditory meatus. Styloid process which is placed anteroinferiorly, it gives attachment to three muscles. They are stylohyoid, styloglossus, stylopharyngeus and two ligaments. They are stylohyoid ligament, stylomandibular ligament. Zygomatic process means the temporal bone gives the zygomatic process which articulates with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to form the zygomatic arch. Next case is while performing cortical mastoidectomy, the head and neck surgeon drills the bone up to the sitilis angle. Sitilis angle or sinodural angle is the angle seen between the sigmoid sinus plate and tegmen or dural plate. The boundaries of cortical mastoidectomy are tegmen plate superiorly, sigmoid sinus plate posteriorly, posterior bony external auditory canal wall anteriorly. This is called the triangle of attack. Next case is endolymphatic sac surgery is performed on a patient who has Meniere's disease with intractable vertigo. In this case, Donaldson's line is the surgical landmark to locate the endolymphatic sac. It is an imaginary line drawn from the horizontal semicircular canal which bisects the posterior semicircular canal. The endolymphatic sac lies just below this. Next case is a head and neck surgeon enters the cranial cavity via the Trotman's triangle. Trotman's triangle is a landmark to approach the posterior cranial fossa. It is a triangular area on the medial wall of the mastoid antrum. It is bounded superiorly by the dura or superior petrosal sinus, posteriorly by the sigmoid sinus and anteriorly by the bony labyrinth. Since here the bone is thin, it can lead to the spreading of infections from the mastoid to the cerebellum. Next case is autoendoscopy of a patient revealed cholesteatoma limited to the pro tympanum. In this case, the part of the middle ear around the eustachian tube is referred to as pro-tympanum. The middle ear is divided into three main parts. They are epitympanum or attic, mesotympanum, hypotympanum. Epitympanum or attic is situated above the level of pars tensa, medial to pars flaccida and scutum. Mesotympanum is present opposite the pars tensa. Hypotympanum is present below the level of tympanic membrane. Mesotympanum is the narrowest part of the middle ear. 
transverse diameters of middle ear at various levels are epitympanum 6 mm, mesotympanum 2 mm, hypotympanum 4 mm. The distance between the promontory and tympanic membrane, that is the transverse diameter at the level of mesotympanum, is 2 mm. Next case is, in a patient with necrotizing otitis media, CT scans reveal erosions of the structures present in the epitympanum. In this case, food plate of stepes is least likely to be involved in the given scenario because it is not a part of epitympanum. Epitympanum contains head of the malleus, incudomalleolar joint, short process and the body of incus. Next case is, while performing tympanoplasty, the ENT surgeon notices that the floor of the middle ear is deficient. In this case, the internal jugular vein is susceptible to injury. The floor of the middle ear is related to the internal jugular vein. Occasionally, the floor is deficient and the jugular bulb is then covered only by fibrous tissue and a mucous membrane making it susceptible to injury during middle ear surgery. The middle ear can be likened to a room with a roof, floor and four walls that is anterior, posterior, medial and lateral. The Tickman tympani forms the roof of the middle ear. It separates the tympanic cavity from the middle cranial fossa. It also extends posteriorly to form the roof of the aditus and androm as Tegman mastoidi. Next case is CT scan of a patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma revealed that the tumor has undergone a local spread destroying the anterior wall of the middle ear. In this case, the prominence of the facial canal is least likely to be injured because it is a part of the medial wall of the middle ear and not the anterior wall. The anterior wall of the middle ear is related to the following structures. They are eustachian tube, the canal for tensor tympani, internal carotid artery. The subiculum is not a part of lateral wall of the middle ear. It is present in the medial wall below the sinus tympani. The lateral wall of the middle ear separates it from external ear. It contains pars tensa which is lying opposite to the mesotympanum, pars flaccida and scutum which is lying opposite to the epitympanum. Scutum or lateral attic wall is a wedge shaped bone that separates the epitympanum from the external auditory canal. It can be eroded in attic cholesteatomas. The round window is not related to the pyramid because it is a medial wall structure whereas the pyramid is a projection present in the posterior wall. The pyramid has the following features. It contains stepidious muscle and the tendon leaves the pyramid to attach the neck of the stepes. It divides the posterior space into a medial sinus tympani and a lateral facial recess. It serves as the landmark for the second genu of the facial nerve and houses the vertical segment of the facial nerve and the nerve to stepidius. The aditus, that is the opening to mastoid, lies just above it. Next case is, you are approaching the middle ear via the mastoid through the facial recess. Regarding anatomical relations of facial recess, Facial recess or the posterior sinus is a depression in the posterior wall lateral to the pyramid. It is bounded medially by the vertical part of the facial nerve, laterally by the coda tympani and above by the fossa incudis. Facial recess is important surgically as direct access can be made through this into the middle ear without disturbing the posterior canal wall. This is called intact canal wall technique. Next case is a child with cholesteatoma undergoes surgical removal via an intact canal wall procedure. In this case, in intact canal wall surgeries, the middle ear is approached through suprapyramidal recess. Surgically, facial recess or posterior sinus or suprapyramidal recess is important as direct access can be made through this into the middle ear without disturbing the posterior canal wall that is intact canal wall technique. The basal turn of the cochlea forms the promontory. The promontory is a bulge in the middle ear's medial wall which is formed by the labyrinth. It gives two extensions that is subiculum present below to the round window and ponticulus which is situated to the posterior wall. 
The smallest bone in the body is tepes. It is also called a stirrup as it looks like the stirrup or footrest for jockeys while riding a horse. The malleus is called the hammer. The incus is called the anvil which is a large metal striking surface for shaping metals. The type of joint between the middle ear ossicle is the synovial joint. The malleo-incudal joint is a saddle type. The incudostepedial joint is a ball and socket type. The incus articulates with the malleus and has a short process and a long process. The long process articulates with the head of the stepes. Fossa incudis gives attachment to the short process of incus. Fossa incudis is a depression on the posterior wall of the middle ear. It lies lateral to aditus and antrum. The oval window is covered by the foot plate of stepes. The movement of the stepes foot plate causes vibration in the scala vestibuli. This is because the scala vestibuli which opens at the oval window is closed by the foot plate of stepes. The scala tympani opens at the round window. The round window or the fenestra cochlea is covered by the secondary tympanic membrane. It is just a layer of mucous membrane. Processus cochleariformis is related to the tendon of tensor tympani. Just anterior to the oval window, the medial wall presents a hook-like projection called the processus cochleariformis. The tendon of tensor tympani takes a turn here to get the attachment to the neck of malleus. It is also the landmark for the first geno of the facial nerve and the geniculate ganglion. Next case is Impedance audiometry performed in a patient showed absent stepedial reflex. In this case, the absence of stepedial reflex is suggestive of facial nerve injury. The facial nerve forms the efferent arm of the stepedial or acoustic reflex. Anatomy of stepedius muscle is, stepedius is a second arch muscle and it arises from the pyramid and attaches to the neck of the stepes. Its action is to laterize the stepes and dampen loud sounds. It is supplied by a branch of facial nerve. In detail about the stepedial reflex, principle is a loud sound of 70 to 100 decibel above the hearing threshold of the patient leads to bilateral contraction of the stepedius muscle. Here the afferent is 8th cranial nerve and efferent is 7th cranial nerve. Center is superior olivary complex in the brainstem. In afferent palsy, the reflex is absent on both sides and in efferent palsy, reflex is absent only on the side of lesion. Clinical significance is it can identify malingerers. To differentiate cochlear and retrocochlear hearing loss, it is used. Here the threshold is decreased in cochlear lesions because of recruitment whereas it is increased or even absent in retrocochlear lesions. It is also used to identify the site of facial nerve lesion. Its presence indicates that the lesion is beyond the nerve to stepedius. Acoustic reflex decay is it is a feature of retrocochlear hearing loss that is eighth nerve lesion. A sustained tone of 500 to 1000 hertz delivered 10 decibel above the acoustic reflex threshold for a period of 10 seconds brings the amplitude to 50 percentage that is abnormal decay. Tensor tympani is supplied by a branch from the medial pterygoid nerve which is a direct branch of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve and not the posterior division of mandibular nerve. Anatomical features of tensor tympani muscle are the tensor tympani develops from the first arch. It arises from the semi canal for tensor tympani in the anterior wall of the middle ear. Hooks around the processus cochleariformis in the medial wall. Attaches the neck of the malleus in the lateral wall. Tensor tympani muscle's action is to medialize the malleus and conduct sound. The posterior division of the mandibular nerve is mainly sensory and divides into three branches. They are the auriculotemporal nerve, the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve or dental nerve. The motor component of the posterior division of the mandibular nerve supplies the mylohyoid and anterior belly of the digastric. The sensory supply to the middle ear cavity is provided by the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve. It forms the tympanic plexus with the keratico-tympanic nerves from the internal carotid plexus of the sympathetic fibers. 
the tympanic branch of the facial nerve does not contribute to the tympanic plexus the tympanic plexus is formed by three nerves they are the glossopharyngeal nerve which forms the tympanic branch the sympathetic fibers from internal carotid plexus which forms the superior and inferior carotico tympanic nerve the tympanic plexus innervates the tympanic membrane's medial surface the tympanic cavity mastoid air cells and the bony eustachian tube it also carries secretory fibers for the parotid gland and in frier syndrome the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve can be sectioned the facial nerve runs horizontally in the medial wall and vertically in the posterior wall of the middle ear the medial wall is related to the third part which runs from first genu that is processus cochlearyformis to second genu that is pyramid it is called the tympanic or horizontal part the posterior wall is related to the fourth part which runs from the genu that is pyramid to the stylomastoid foramen where it exists the temporal bone it is called the mastoid or the vertical part In the middle ear the chorda tympani runs in between the malleus and incus chorda tympani is the branch of vertical segment or the fourth part of facial nerve it gives out branches in the posterior wall of the middle ear course of chorda tympani is it runs obliquely in the posterior wall and enters middle ear medial to the tympanic membrane travels posterior to anterior between the malleus and incus it leaves middle ear at petro tympanic fissure or canal of hagier enters the impra temporal fossa joins the lingual nerve and release in submandibular ganglion supply of coda tympani is it carries taste from anterior two third of the tongue it gives parasympathetic secreto motor to submandibular and sublingual glands the fibers of the lesser petrosal nerve synapse in the aortic ganglion The lesser petrosal nerve is the parasympathetic or secretomotor nerve for the parotid glands. It arises over the promontory of the middle ear from the tympanic plexus that is glossopharyngeal nerve. Next case is you are assisting an ENT surgeon who places a cochlear implant into the scalar tympani. In this case the implant is placed in the cochlea which is a part of inner ear. The inner ear lies in the petrous part of temporal bone. The inner ear is well protected between the medial wall of the middle ear and the internal auditory canal. The electrode of a cochlear implant is placed in the scalar tympani. Cochlear implant is an electronic device for severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss and who cannot benefit from hearing aid. Principle of cochlear implant is surgery is done to place the electrode array within the scalar tympani of cochlea. Indication of cochlear implant is bilateral severe to profound deafness. Prerequisites are intact eighth nerve and higher auditory pathway. Surgical approach is by facial recess that is posterior tympanotomy approach. In the auditory brain stem implant the site of the implant is the lateral recess of fourth ventricle. Next case is you are examining the CT scan image of the temporal bone of a patient. In this case the organ of corti presence in the scala media is a part of membranous labyrinth it cannot be visualized on a ct scan bony labyrinth consists of vestibule cochlea semicircular canals these structures can be seen on a ct scan of the temporal bone membranous labyrinth consists of secule and utricle cochlear duct or scala media semicircular ducts and endolymphatic duct and sac The bony cochlea is a coiled tube making 2.5 to 2.75 turns round a central pyramid of bone called modiolus. The scala vestibuli and scala tympani communicate with each other at the apex of the cochlea through an opening called helicotrema. Scala tympani and subarachnoid space are connected by the aqueduct of cochlea. Scala media is a part of membranous cochlea. The bony cochlea is a coiled tube with 2.5 to 2.75 turns around a central pyramid of bone called modiolus. From the modiolus laterally into the tube winding like the thread of a screw is the osseous spiral lamina. 
Spiral lamina along with membranes attached to it divide the tube into three parts. They are scala vestibuli above, scala media in between, scala tympani below. The scala vestibule and tympani are the part of bony labyrinth and are filled with peri lymph. They communicate with each other at the apex called helicotrema. Scala media is a part of membranous cochlea and contains the sensory organ of corte with hair cells. Vestibule contains the spherical recess for the saccule. It is a part of bony labyrinth and not a part of auditory pathway. The inside of the medial wall presents with recess and openings. A spherical recess which lodges the saccule, an elliptical recess which lodges the utricle, an opening for aqueduct of vestibule, an opening for the semicircular canals. Next case is a patient has undergone a high resolution CT of the temporal bone which confirmed a diagnosis of semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome. In this case, the semicircular canals are a part of bony labyrinth. They house the semicircular ducts which are the end organs for angular momentum. They are three in number that is superior, posterior and lateral. Superior which is also known as anterior in the x-axis, posterior in y-axis and lateral which is known as horizontal in z-axis. Semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome is an inner ear abnormality where the bony covering of the semicircular canal is very thin or absent. It usually affects the superior semicircular canal but can rarely involve the posterior or lateral semicircular canals. The superior semicircular canal is present inferior to arcuate eminence of the temporal bone. Crus commune is a part of semicircular canals. Each semicircular canal has two ends that is ampullated and non-ampullated which opens into the vestibule. The non-ampullated end of posterior and superior canals unite to form a common channel called crus commune. Next case is a 45-year-old construction worker presents to you with hearing loss. His audiogram reveals a diagnosis of noise-induced hearing loss. In this case, the organ of corti is the sensory organ of hearing and it is situated on the basilar membrane. Chronic exposure to loud noises may mechanically damage the organ of corti and result in noise-induced hearing loss. The organ of corti is situated over the basilar membrane in scala media. The basilar membrane separates scala media from tympani and supports organ of corti. Reisner's membrane separates scala media from scala vestibuli. Stria vascularis is the lateral part of scala media which secretes endolymph. Shrapnel's membrane is another name for pars flaccida of the tympanic membrane. Endolymph is akin to intracellular fluid and hence it is high in potassium. Perilymph and CSF are both extracellular fluids that are high in sodium. Perilymph is found in bony labyrinth. It is similar to extracellular fluid. It is rich in sodium ions. Formation of perilymph is filtrate of blood or directly from CSF. Drainage of perilymph is it is into the CSF via cochlear aqueduct. Next is about endolymph. Endolymph is found in membranous labyrinth. It is similar to intracellular fluid. Endolymph is rich in potassium ions. Endolymph is produced by stria vascularis. It is absorbed through endolymphatic sac. Endolymph is present in the scala media. The stria vascularis contains vascular epithelium and is concerned with secretion of endolymph. Next case is a 20-year-old man diagnosed with meningitis later develops sensorineural hearing loss. Here, in this case, infections can spread from CNS to the inner ear or vice versa through the aqueduct of cochlea. Scala tympani is connected with the subarachnoid space through this structure. Higher frequencies of sound are heard at the basal coil while lower frequencies are heard at the apical coil of membranous cochlea. This is because the length of basilar membrane increases as we proceed from the basal coil to the apical coil. Next is about the sensory receptors in inner ear. The receptor of organ of corti is hair cell. Receptor of ampulla of semicircular duct is cristae. 
receptor of otolith organs like utricle and saccule is macula action of organ of corti is sound conduction action of ampulla of semicircular duct is angular momentum action of utricle and saccule is linear momentum the tectorial membrane overlies the organ of corti Reisner's membrane separates scala vestibuli and scala media the basilar membrane supports the organ of corti the sensory epithelium of the utricle and saccule is called macula and it is concerned with linear acceleration and deceleration the ampullated end of each semicircular canal contains a thickened ridge of neuroepithelium called crista ampullaris semicircular canals respond to angular acceleration and deceleration the receptors are the cristae which is located in the ampullated end of the three semicircular ducts their utricle and saccule which contain macula are stimulated by linear acceleration and deceleration or gravitational pull during the head tilt the endolymphatic duct is formed by the union of two duct one each from the saccule and the utricle it passes through the vestibular aqueduct its terminal part is dilated to form an endolymphatic sac which lies between the two layers of dura on the posterior surface of petrous bone the scala vestibuli and scala tympani are filled with perilymph and communicate with each other at the apex of cochlea through an opening called helicotrema aqueduct of cochlea connects scala tympani with subarachnoid space ductus reunions connect the cochlear duct to the saccule blood supply to the inner ear is by a branch of anterior inferior cerebellar artery the inner ear is supplied by labyrinthine artery which is a branch of anterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch of basilar artery the terminal part of endolymphatic duct is dilated to form an endolymphatic sac which lies between the two layers of dura on the posterior surface of petrous bone endolymphatic sac is surgically important it is exposed for drainage or shunt operation in meniere's disease case presentation in a 7 year old child with hearing loss and intellectual disability you notice an external ear anomaly that is pre auricular tag or appendage in detail about this pre auricular tag or appendages are congenital external ear anomaly they are seen as skin covered pieces of cartilage anywhere between the tragus and the angle of mouth the clinical features of facial asymmetry intellectual disability limbal dermoid and pre auricular tags and mixed or conductive hearing loss points to a diagnosis of golden haar syndrome that is oculo auriculo vertebral spectrum clinical features include hypoplasia of the malar maxillary and mandibular region macrostomia and microtia pre auricular and facial skin tags hemi vertebrae usually cervical intellectual disability cardiac renal and central nervous system anomalies ocular features like limbal dermoid upper lid notching or coloboma microphthalmos disc coloboma next case is a patient presents to opd with pre auricular sinus which is seen in between the tragus and crest of the helix and there is a history of pus discharge from the same area it is the most common congenital anomaly of the first brachial arch which is due to the incomplete fusion of the hillocks of his that develop to form the pinna it can be repeatedly infected and form an abscess which would then require excision next case is an 8 month old child was brought to opd with malformed small pinna appearing like tubercles which is suggestive of microtia it is frequently accompanied by hearing loss congenital anomalies of pinna are microtia which is small pinna anosia that is absent pinna and stenosis of outer external auditory canal bat ear that is absent antihelix mozart ear that is fusion of helix and antihelix wilder mat ear that is absent helix macrotia that is large pinna next case is a child with protruding ear is brought to opd by his worried parents they opt for surgical correction of the defect due to cosmetic reasons in this case 
protruding ears or bat ears which can be corrected any time after 6 years of age if cosmetic appearance demands this is due to the fact that the pinna is completely developed and achieves adult configuration by the age of 6 years protruding ears are caused by a large concha with poorly developed antihelix and scapha next case is A 5-year-old girl was brought to you with complaints of serous discharge from a cutaneous opening on the right side of her neck. A fistulogram confirms your diagnosis of choleral fistula. Choleral fistula transverses close to the facial nerve within the substance of parotid. It is a congenital anomaly of first branchial cleft. The fistula is between the external auditory canal and neck where the upper opening is on the floor of the external auditory canal and the lower opening is on the neck between mandible and sternocleidomastoid. Next case is a professional wrestler presents to your OPD with the deformity that is uh, cauliflower ear deformity which is due to auricular hematoma. In detail about auricular hematoma, it is a collection of blood between the auricular cartilage and its pericontrium. If left untreated, the extravasated blood may clot and then organize, resulting in a typical deformity called cauliflower ear. It is also called pugilistic or boxer's ear. It is often seen in boxers, wrestlers and rugby players due to blunt trauma. Treatment comprises of aspiration of the hematoma under strict aseptic precautions and a pressure dressing to prevent reaccumulation. Aspiration may need to be repeated. If aspiration fails, incision and drainage should be done. All cases should receive prophylactic antibiotics. Next are some eponyms of the ear. Boxers or cauliflower ear is due to organized hematoma of pinna. Surfer's ear is due to exostosis. Swimmer's ear is due to diffuse otitis externa. Next case is, a young man is rushed to the emergency department following a road traffic accident with severe injuries and a completely avulsed pinna. The avulsed pinna is preserved by peeling its skin and inserting the cartilage into the post-auricular area which can be preserved for delayed reconstruction. However, immediate re-implantation using microvascular technique would be ideal. If the pinna is still attached to the head by a small pedicle of skin, primary reattachment should be considered. Next case is the most likely diagnosis of a patient presenting with painful erythematous ear swelling is suggestive of perichondritis. The most common cause is trauma, either atrogenic that is surgical incision or non-atrogenic due to laceration or hematoma. It can be due to the extension of infection from diffuse otitis externa or pharyngeal of the meatus. The most common organism responsible is Pseudomonas originosa. Chondrodermatitis chronica helicis is a small nodular tender chronic inflammatory lesion occurring on the helix of the ear. Otitis externa, which is also known as swimmer's ear, is the inflammation of the ear canal. Next case is a middle-aged man presented with a small tender nodule in the helix. The patient is presenting with difficulty sleeping on the affected side. There is no history of trauma. This is uh, suggestive of chondrodermatitis nodularis chronica helicis. Treatment includes excision of the lesion. Keloid commonly occurs following trauma. The common sites are lobule and helix. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy does not reduce its recurrence post excisions. There is high chance of recurrence after excision which can be prevented by intralational steroids pre and post operative radiotherapy. Patients with repeated attacks of pharyngolosis should be investigated for diabetes mellitus. A pharyngeal is a staphylococcal infection of the hair follicle as the hairs are confined only to the cartilaginous part of the meatus. Pharyngeal is seen only outer one third of external auditory canal. Symptoms are severe compared to signs as the skin over the external auditory canal is tightly adherent. The tragal sign is positive and there is an obliteration of the retroauricular groove. Treated by incision and drainage or 10% ichthamol glycerin wicks and antibiotics. Swimmer's ear is synonymous with diffuse otitis externa. The normal pH of the external auditory canal is acidic. Any condition that makes the pH alkaline predisposes to otitis externa. 
This includes situations such as hot and humid climate that is excessive sweating and prolonged swimming. Next is a case. A 40-year-old male presents with right-sided ear discharge, itching and pain for the past 4 days. He gives a history of insect entry into the external auditory canal which he removed himself. On examination, there is purulent discharge in a narrow canal and the tympanic membrane is normal. This clinical scenario is suggestive of diffuse otitis externa following a trauma. Oral toilet remains the most effective single treatment for this condition. All exudate and debris should be carefully removed with special emphasis on the andro-inferior meatal recess, which forms a blind pocket and act as a reservoir of infective secretion. The oral toilet can be done by dry mopping, suction clearance or irrigating the canal with warm sterile normal saline. Further treatment modalities are, after the oral toilet is done, wicks medicated with antibiotic steroid preparation can be used. These wicks have to be changed daily for 2-3 to three days, which thereafter can be substituted by ear drops. Broad spectrum systemic antibiotics are used when there is cellulitis and acute tender lymphadenitis. Analgesics are usually a part of management as otitis externa is associated with severe pain. Gauze wick soaked in 10% ichthamol glycerin is used to reduce swelling. Astringents such as aluminium acetate 8% or silver nitrate 3% are used to dry up an oozing meatus. Otomycosis is a fungal infection of the ear canal that often occurs due to Aspergillus niger which is most common. Aspergillus fumigatus or Candida albicans, these all can cause otomycosis. Next case is, a young man presented with irritation and itching in the ear associated with watery discharge and a musty odor. Otoscopic image shows black-headed filamentous growth which is suggestive of otomycosis by Aspergillus niger. Irritation and itching are the most predominant symptoms of Aspergillus niger infection. Pain is predominant in Aspergillus flavus infection. The fungal mass in otomycosis is likened to a wet blotting paper or wet newspaper appearance. The appearance of otomycosis on otoscopy and the causative organisms are black-headed filamentous growth which is by Aspergillus niger infection, green or brown which is by Aspergillus fumigatus infection, white and creamy deposit which is by Candida infection. Rhizopus orizae is one of the causative agents of mucormycosis. The common clinical form of this opportunistic infection is rhinoobital cerebral mucormycosis that is ROCM. It is rarely implicated in otomycosis. Next case is a 30-year-old woman presents to OPD with right-sided facial weakness. On examination, she has vesicles in the external auditory canal and over the tympanic membrane. The given clinical scenario of facial paralysis along with vesicular eruptions in the external auditory canal and tympanic membrane is suggestive of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome which is also known as herpes zoster oticus. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is caused by reactivation of herpes zoster in the geniculate ganglion. In most patients, there is an involvement of the trunk of the facial nerve which results in severe facial palsy. Often, the 8th cranial nerve is also involved which causes hearing loss and vertigo. There may be also anesthesia of the face due to involvement of 5th cranial nerve. Bell's palsy is an idiopathic peripheral facial paralysis or paralysis of acute onset due to a lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve. Moby syndrome is a congenital unilateral or bilateral lower motor neuron facial nerve paralysis with abducens spalsy causing abnormal ocular abduction. Melkerson syndrome is an idiopathic disorder consisting of a triad of facial paralysis, swelling of lips and fissured tongue. Next case is a 60-year-old diabetic presents to emergency department with fever, excruciating left ear pain and otorrhea which is unresponsive to antibiotics. On examination, she has a deviation of the angle of mouth to the right side and granulation tissue seen in the left external auditory canal. The clinical scenario of an elderly diabetic with severe oltalgia, otorrhea, granulation tissue in the external auditory canal and lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy indicates malignant otitis externa. It is termed malignant even though it is an infection due to high mortality rate and poor response to treatment. 
Technetium-99 bone scan remains positive for a year or so and cannot be used to follow up response to treatment. It is particularly useful when the clinical suspicion for malignant otitis externa is high but the CT scan is negative. Features of malignant otitis externa are pseudomonas infection in the elderly diabetes and those on immunosuppressive drugs, excruciating pain, profuse discharge and granulations on the floor of the external auditory canal. Necrosis of bone aids in the spread of infection. Infection may spread to the skull base and jugular foramen causing multiple cranial nerve palsies. Facial paralysis is the most common nerve palsy seen. Mitotic figures will be normal since it is an infective and not a malignant condition. Gallium 67 is more useful in the follow-up of the patient. Next case is, a young man presents to OPD with complaints of intense irritation in the ear following the use of ear drops. Examination reveals vesicle formation, oozing and crusting in the canal. The given clinical scenario is suggestive of eczematous otitis externa and the drug implicated is neomycin. Eczematous otitis externa is due to hypersensitivity to infective organism or topical ear drugs such as chloromycetin or neomycin etc. The presence of intense irritation, vesicle formation, oozing and crusting in the canal is observed. Management involves stopping the implicated ear drops, changing to a different combination and application of steroid cream. Otitis externa hemorrhagica is a condition characterized by the formation of hemorrhagic bullae on tympanic membrane and deep meatus. This causes severe pain in the ear and bloodstain discharge when the bullae rupture. It is probably viral in origin. Wax or cerumen is not made up of middle ear discharge. Composition of wax is secretions of ceruminous glands that is modified apocrine sweat glands, secretions of the sebaceous gland that is fatty secretion, desquamated epithelial cells and hair. These are the composition of wax. Wax is normally expelled by the movement of the jaw during eating, talking. Functions include antibacterial action and trapping of foreign bodies and dirt. Impacted wax causes a sensation of blockage of the ear, reduced hearing, vertigo, tinnitus. Treatment is softening with ceruminolytics like 2% para-dichlorobenzene, 5% sodium bicarbonate in equal parts of glycerin and water, syringing or instrumentation or suction clearance. Ceruminous glands are modified apocrine sweat glands. Ceruminous and sebaceous glands open into the space of the hair follicle in the external auditory canal. During syringing, the pinna is pulled upwards and backwards and the water jet is directed along the posterior superior wall of the meatus. This is preferred because of two anatomical reasons, that is, first one, on manoeuvring the pinna to bring the external auditory canal into a straight configuration, the posterior wall is straighter and easily accessible than the anterior wall. Next is, the posterior inferior wall of external auditory canal is supplied by the vagus. Direct stimulation of this can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. Complications of syringing are vertigo, that is caloric stimulation of lateral semicircular canal if water is too hot or too cold, rupture of the tympanic membrane, reactivation of cusent otitis media if there is pre-existing perforation. These are the complications of syringing. Contraindications for syringing are presence of ear infection, tympanic membrane perforation, presence of grommet or history of ear surgery. Keratosis obturans is the collection of pearly white mass of desquamated epithelial cells in the deep meatus. The keratin plug is arranged in a lamellar fashion, not at a random pattern. Keratosis obturans by pressure effect causes absorption of bone which causes widening that is not narrowing of the meatus leading to facial nerve palsy. That means there will be widening of the meatus which leads to facial nerve palsy. Normally, epithelium from the surface of the tympanic membrane migrates onto the posterior meatal wall. Failure of this migration or obstruction to migration caused by wax may lead to keratosis obturans, which is the accumulation of large plug of desquamated keratin in the external auditory meatus. Features of keratosis obturans are severe otalgia, conductive hearing loss, thickened tympanic membrane, keratin plug or pearly white mass occluding the canal, 
widened ear canal which may lead to facial nerve paralysis, hyperemia of canal skin sometimes with ulcerations and granulations. Staphylococcus aureus is the most frequent isolate. Keratosis obturans may be associated with systemic conditions like bronchiectasis and chronic sinusitis. The surgery done to widen the cartilaginous part of external auditory canal is meatoplasty. It is performed in combination with all canal wall down procedures like modified radical and radical mastoidectomies for the treatment of middle ear disease such as cholesteatoma. The widened meatus helps easily visualize and access the mastoid cavity for periodic inspection and cleaning. It is also done as an isolated procedure in elderly people with sagging auricle. Sagging auricle causes obstruction to the meatus leading to retention of wax and difficulty in hearing. Tympanoplasty is the surgical reconstruction to correct damage in the middle ear and restore the integrity of the tympanic membrane for improved hearing. Meringoplasty refers to the reconstruction of the tympanic membrane only. Otoplasty is the correction of external ear or deformities of the pinna. Meatoplasty is not a part of canal wall up procedure as the meatus appears normal. However, meatoplasty is performed in combination with all canal wall down procedures like modified radical and radical mastoidectomies for the treatment of middle ear disease such as cholesteatoma. The widened meatus helps to visualize and access the mastoid cavity for periodic inspection and cleaning. It is also done in atresia or stenosis to recanalize the ear and in tortuous canals post tympanoplasty to improve hearing. The normal tympanic membrane is concave to the external auditory canal with the maximum concavity at the umbo. Features of normal tympanic membrane are pearly grey in color, shiny, degree of transparency varies, mobile with change in middle ear pressures. A retracted tympanic membrane is dull and lusterless, it is not shiny and pearly white. Features of retracted tympanic membrane are the cone of light is absent or interrupted, the handle of malleus appears foreshortened, the lateral process of malleus becomes more prominent, anterior and posterior malleal folds become sickle shaped. Next case is while performing routine otoscopy, a patient is found to have tympanic membrane retraction with the past tensor draping over the inguro-stepedial joint. Grades of retraction include SAID classification of retraction of past tensor as well as TOS classification of retraction of past flaccida. First talking about the SAID classification of retraction of past tensor, grade 1, mild retraction no touching the long process of incus. Grade 2 Retracted drum touching the long process of incus. Grade 3 Touching promontory but mobile on sigillization that is atelectasis of the middle ear. Grade 4 Plastered to promontory and immobile which is adhesive middle ear. Next is TOS classification of retraction of pars flaccida. Grade 1 Mild attic retraction no touching the neck of malleus. Grade 2 Touching the neck of malleus. Grade 3 – Limited Outer Attic Wall Erosion Grade 4 – Severe Outer Attic Wall Erosion The Eustachian tube is the most common route of infection in acute separative otitis media. The infection travels via the lumen of the tube or along subepithelial peritubal lymphatics. It can also spread from the external ear through a traumatic perforation or via the blood but it is rare. Coanal atresia does not predispose to eustachian tube obstruction. Eustachian tube obstruction is caused by extrinsic causes like adenoid hypertrophy, nasal pack, nasopharyngeal tumors, intrinsic causes like allergic rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, upper respiratory tract infection, defective functioning of the tube by Down syndrome, submucous cleft palate and cleft palate. Eustachian tube obstruction can lead to complications such as acute separative otitis media, otitis media with effusion, chronic separative otitis media, atelectasis and ossicular necrosis. Next is a case. A worried mother brings her febrile infant to the emergency department. He is crying incessantly and clutching his ear. On otoscopy, there is congested tympanic membrane with purulent effusion and absent cone of light which is suggestive of acute separative otitis media. The most likely organism implicated is Streptococcus pneumoniae. 
organism causing acute separative otitis media in infants and young children are streptococcus pneumoniae which is the most common haemophilus influenzae moraxella cataralis streptococcus pyogenes staphylococcus aureus pseudomonas aeruginosa stages of acute separative otitis media are tubal occlusion pre separation separation and resolution symptoms of tubal occlusion are mild earache and deafness Symptoms of pre-separation are throbbing pain, deafness, fever. Symptoms of separation are excruciating earache, deafness and high fever. Symptoms of resolution are ear discharge and patient starts to feel better. Signs of tubal occlusion are retracted tympanic membrane, conductive hearing loss. Signs of pre-separation are cartwheel tympanic membrane and conductive hearing loss. Signs of separation are bulging tympanic membrane with pus and also conductive hearing loss. Signs of resolution is perforation in all quadrants and conductive hearing loss improves. In stage of tubal occlusion, decongestants are used. In stage of pre-separation, antibiotics are used. In stage of separation, meringotomy is done to drain the pus. In stage of resolution, Ear mopping is done with the decongestants and antibiotics. During stage of pre-separation of acute separative otitis media, it is due to prolonged tubal occlusion, pyogenic organisms invade the tympanic cavity. An inflammatory exudate appears in the middle ear and there is congestion of pars tensa. A leash of blood vessels appear along with the handle of malleus and at the periphery of the tympanic membrane imparting it a cartwheel appearance. Later, the whole of the tympanic membrane including pars flaccida becomes uniformly red. Symptoms of this stage include marked earache, a high degree of fever, hearing loss and tinnitus which is seen only in adults. Turing folk tests show the conductive type of hearing loss. Pain is most severe in stage of separation in acute separative otitis media. The most common site of perforation of the tympanic membrane in acute separative otitis media is the posterior half of pars tensa where usually a small perforation is seen. Management of acute separative otitis media in the pre-separation stage involves the usage of antibiotics and decongestants. Meringotomy is indicated only when there is an impending rupture of tympanic membrane. Next is a case. A 23-year-old woman presented to OPD with complaints of excruciating pain in the right ear, deafness and decreased sleep. On examination, she had right-sided lower motor neuron facial nerve paralysis and bulging tympanic membrane on otoscopy. The above clinical scenario points to a diagnosis of acute separative otitis media complicated by right-sided lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Otoscopic finding of bulging tympanic membrane is an indication to perform meringotomy that is surgical opening in the tympanic membrane. Treatment of facial nerve paralysis secondary to otitis media is conservative manage is preferred treatment using antibiotics and corticosteroids. Meringotomy and a ventilation tube should be added when spontaneous perforation of the tympanic membrane has not occurred. Facial nerve decompression is not usually necessary. Tympanoplasty is the removal of disease from the middle ear and reconstruction of hearing with or without meringoplasty. Indications of meringotomy are acute separative otitis media, serous otitis media. In case of acute separative otitis media, there will be severe earache with the bulging tympanic membrane. Incomplete resolution with opaque drum and persistent conductive deafness is seen here. Complications of acute otitis media are facial paralysis, labyrinthitis or meningitis with the bulging tympanic membrane. Next indication for meringotomy is serous otitis media. Aero otitis media is the indication because it is used to drain fluid and unlock the eustachian tube. Next is atelectactic ear that is grommet is often inserted for long term aeration. Contraindication for meringotomy is suspected intratympanic glomus tumor. Incision is in acute separative otitis media, a circumferential incision is made in the posterior inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane, midway between the handle of malleus and tympanic annulus, avoiding injury to the incudus tepedial joint. 
in serous otitis media a small radial incision is given in the antero inferior quadrant and all the effusion is sucked out complications are injury to inguinal stapedial joint or stapes injury to jugular bulb with profuse bleeding if jugular bulb is high and floor of the middle ear is dehiscent middle ear infection is also another complication next case is a 4 year old boy is brought to opd with fever and earache on examination the tympanic membrane appears congested and bulging with a loss of landmark the scenario points towards a diagnosis of acute separative otitis media antibiotics form the mainstay of treatment in acute separative otitis media and if the tympanic membrane is bulging meringotomy should be done meringotomy is the procedure involving incising the tympanic membrane to evacuate pus it is indicated when the tympanic membrane is bulging and there is acute pain there is an incomplete resolution despite antibiotics and the drum remains full with persistent conductive deafness and also when there is persistent effusion beyond 12 weeks next case is you are an ent resident assisting a meringotomy case in a patient with serous otitis media in serous otitis media a radial incision is made in the antero inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane a curvy linear incision is used in acute separative otitis media in the postero inferior quadrant that is smiling incision the lighthouse effect is seen in acute mastoiditis which is a complication of otitis media this effect is described as a pulsatile mucopurulent or purulent discharge coming through a central pinhole perforation of pars tensa this suggests a reservoir of infection in the mastoid and middle ear otoscopic signs in intratympanic glomus tumor include red reflex through an intact tympanic membrane as well as pulsation sign or brown sign which is when ear canal pressure is raised with sigel speculum the tumor pulsates vigorously and then blanches next case is a 6 year old child with measles is brought to opd with complaints of profuse otorrhea otoscopy is suggestive of acute necrotizing otitis media beta hemolytic streptococcus is the most common organism causing acute necrotizing otitis media acute necrotizing otitis media is a variety of acute separative otitis media this is often seen in children suffering from measles scarlet fever or influenza it leads to the destruction of the entire tympanic membrane middle ear mucosa and air cells there is profuse otorrhea in such cases healing is followed by fibrosis or ingrowth of squamous epithelium from the meatus leading to a secondary acute cholesteatoma treatment is early antibiotic therapy for at least 7 to 10 days cortical mastoidectomy may be indicated if medical treatment fails to control or the condition gets complicated by acute mastoiditis otitis media with effusion or glue ear or secretory otitis media it is the most common cause of hearing loss in children clinical features of glue ear include bilateral painless and fluctuating hearing loss conductive hearing loss not more than 40 decibel is observed defective and delayed development of speech is also seen occasional mild ear aches are present here the effusion is thick viscid and sterile in most cases of serous otitis media etiology of serous otitis media are malfunctioning of eustachian tube that is in adenoid hyperplasia in children which causes bilateral serous otitis media benign and malignant tumors of the nasopharynx which should always be excluded in unilateral serous otitis media in an adult cleft lip cleft palate and chronic tonsillitis which is interference with eustachian tube opening other etiology of serous otitis media are otitic barotrauma unresolved acute separative otitis media which is due to inadequate treatment dosage or duration allergy which is due to increased middle ear secretions viral infections that is increased secretory activity due to stimulation of middle ear mucosa next case is you see a child with delayed development of speech as a part of health visit in a local school hearing loss of 20 decibel is detected in audiometric test the otoscopic appearance is golden yellow discoloration of the tympanic membrane which is caused by the clear watery straw colored effusion filling the middle ear 
the given clinical scenario is suggestive of serous otitis media since the fluid is clear one can see the structures of the middle ear quite clearly on otoscopy patients having serous otitis media will have hearing loss that rarely exceeds 40 decibel this deafness can pass unnoticed and may be accidentally discovered during audiometric screening test because of hearing loss the development of speech is delayed or defective Otoscopic findings in serous otitis media are fluid level and air bubbles are seen when fluid is thin and the tympanic membrane is transparent in chronic cases the fluid becomes very sticky hence the name glue ear the tympanic membrane is often dull and opaque with a loss of light reflex the mobility of the tympanic membrane is restricted B type tympanogram is expected in a case of serous otitis media here compliance decreases that is mobility of tympanic membrane is restricted due to the effusion usually secondary to negative middle ear pressure that is eustachian tube obstruction this results in a B type tympanogram hearing test suggestive of conductive hearing loss as seen in serous otitis media are rhenes test negative that is bone conduction more than air conduction webers test it is laterized towards the vers ear in audiogram air conduction is abnormal bone conduction is normal and air bone gap is present impedance audiometry we can see flat curve and also reduced compliance and also shift to the negative side tympanograph is flat when there is fluid in the middle ear Serous otitis media can be managed by cortical mastoidectomy. It is sometimes required for removing loculated thick fluid or other associated pathologies such as cholesterol granuloma. Management of glue ear includes medical management by using antihistaminics, decongestants, antibiotics and valsalva manure. Surgical management is by meringotomy and aspiration, grommet insertion, tympanotomy, cortical mastoidectomy. A grommet is placed in the middle ear to aerate and drain the middle ear. It acts as a substitute for the blocked eustachian tube. It is placed through radial meringotomy in the anteroinferior quadrant. Next is a case. A child with hearing difficulty is diagnosed to have glue ear. Otosclerosis is not a possible sequelae of glue ear. Otosclerosis is a hereditary disease of the bone of the inner ear which mostly affects the stippy's foot plate area. It is not related to other ear pathologies. The sequelae of long standing glue ear include atrophy of tympanic membrane and meringosclerosis that is fibrosis of tympanic membrane and telectasis of middle ear when the tympanic membrane gets retracted over the promontory osicular neck necrosis tympanosclerosis that is collagen deposits within the middle ear retraction pockets in tympanic membrane and cholecystic steatoma cholesterol granulomas which is due to stasis of secretions in the mastoid and middle ear ear ache is not a feature of tubercular otitis media tuberculosis of the ear is usually secondary to pulmonary tuberculosis it presents as painless condition with foul smelling discharge from the ear multiple perforations in past tensa of the tympanic membrane and pale granulations in the middle ear cleft are seen next case is a 42 year old farmer presented to your clinic after developing painless otorrhea and hearing loss in his right ear examination revealed multiple perforations in the past tensa in addition to a purulent foul smelling discharge with right facial nerve palsy audiometry indicated a 35 decibel conductive hearing loss the clinical stem consisting of painless otorrhea conductive hearing loss with multiple perforations in the past tensa and right facial nerve palsy point to a diagnosis of tuberculous otitis media for which corticosteroids do not form an essential part of the treatment tuberculosis of the ear usually occurs secondary to pulmonary tuberculosis it is occasionally blood borne spreading from a tubercular focus in the lungs tonsils cervical or mesenteric lymph nodes tuberculous otitis media is mostly seen in children and young adults it presents as a painless condition with foul smelling discharge from the ear that does not respond to standard antibiotic treatment a thickened tympanic membrane with multiple perforations in the past tensa of the tympanic membrane and pale granulations in the middle ear cleft is seen facial nerve palsy is the most common complication mastoiditis 
post auricular fistula, osteomyelitis are also seen. Histopathology shows submucosal tubercles with Langhans giant cells and caseation necrosis. Smears and culture of ear discharge may be positive for acid fast bacilli. Chest x ray features of tuberculosis along with other evidence of tuberculosis in the body help in confirmation of the diagnosis. DNA probe and PCR from the ear discharge can provide an early diagnosis. Treatment includes antitubercular therapy, oral toilet, treatment of secondary infection, mastoid surgery for complications. Reconstructive middle ear surgery is delayed till antitubercular therapy has been completed.